Good morning. Welcome to Fellowship at Field Store. We're so glad that you guys have joined us here in person in the room. And we also want to welcome everybody from Facebook. Uh, thanks for being with us this morning. We're going to join together as we sing Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Fill my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. All for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto Thy love has blessed me. Thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, the grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I'd like to invite everybody in the room to just greet one another. Say howdy. Thee. And 
right, you guys can be seated. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. All right, so a few, uh, f- a quick announcement real quick. Uh, I have Pastor Joseph here, and he has a, a quick announcement. Okay, students, after church today, we're going to have an event. Most of you probably already know that, but it's going to be over in the fellowship hall. We're just going to get together, have some fellowship and games, and uh, pizza will be provided, so um, don't worry about you know eating lunch or anything. We'll have that for you. Should be a good time. Uh, parents, uh, it's going to last till 3.30, so make sure to come get them. We don't want to keep them all night. Um, and... <laughs> As far as events go, um, you know, just kind of getting into this role right now, and so trying to plan what we're going to do. Summer is still somewhat up in the air as far as what events look like, so I am trying to get some things uh, set in stone as far as dates for you guys to know what's coming up, and uh, down the road, you know, I'll, I'll try and get it up on Facebook or get it wherever it needs to be for the parents to know. Um, If you are a parent and you need my phone number so you can contact me personally, just come, you know, I'll give that to you guys. And so anyways, I want the communication to be clear about it, but right now it's just trying to work out the details as far as what we're going to do. I do know there are going to be a couple events. Right now I'm shooting for one event a month, you know, and um, maybe some other things here and there in between. So anyways, just wanted to keep you guys informed about what's going on. Great. Thank you so much, Pastor Joseph. Appreciate your help uh, with our youth. Okay, if you want to turn your uh, attention to the bulletin, first and foremost, I uh, just want to share with you guys, and you guys know this, is that on Wednesday we have our, we resume um, our, our dinner at 6 p.m. and then Bible study at 7. We've had great turnout, uh, especially with our men's group as well and for the ladies. So just continue to share the knowledge of information of our programming for our children, our youth, and our adults. Uh, secondly, uh, if you look at your bulletin, there's a, it says a love offering. As you guys recall, um, a, lo- a few weeks ago, we had Brooke's um, um, uh, eventful <laughs> baptism uh, and a, a good close uh, friend of theirs uh, named Cindy, whom you guys know, her car burned down. So if you feel led uh, by the Lord uh, to make sure to do a love offering, you can put it and insert it here. Uh, in this, and then you can put it on the offering plate. Or if you have any questions, or if you want to talk to somebody, you can uh, reach out to Miss Modell, and she can give you more information. Also, her lovely card that she had written uh, for us as a church, it's going to be in the in the foyer. Make sure you read that, so um, just to be able to share her appreciation uh, and our love for her. Okay, so next thing, uh, as you guys know, we've been praying. We've been having our Monday night prayer uh, uh, at kind of different locations last week because Mr. Wendell and, and uh, they're, they're out and I just got back into town. We had to postpone last week, but we will resume that tomorrow and we'll be having our prayer meeting at 6.30 to 7.30 uh, sharp at um, Prem and Annie's place. So Prem, if you, you guys want to raise your hand so people know you, who you guys are, they live down, uh, down this way. So anyways, make sure you join us for prayer for that. There's a, a really good thing for us to be praying about. Uh, Today, uh, for those that are uh, tuning in on Facebook and for us here, we will be doing the Lord's Supper after service, so make sure you prepare for that uh, at home for those that are uh, are doing that. Uh, But besides that, it's good to be be back in town, and I'll give it to Brother Carl. All right, then. I would like to say it's good to be back in town as well. Unfortunately. Haven't been anywhere. (laughs) But it's good to be here. It's great to be here. And uh, gentlemen, if I could get uh, four of you to come up and let's uh, receive our morning offering at this time. We got one. We got two. We got three. And four. Thank you so much. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the way that you work with us, the way you put up with us, God, the way you love us, the way you've demonstrated your love for us. Even when we've been unfaithful, God, you've always been faithful. We thank you so grateful for that. God, I pray that you'll help us as we return a portion of what you've given us um, to your work, God, that we would use that work to honor and glorify your name. We would reach into this community. We would touch hearts and lives. We just lift up Pastor Jackson and, and Pastor Joseph as they work with our youth and adults. God, we thank you for each Sunday school teacher. Father, I pray that you'll help us. Father, put feet to obedience, that we would really follow you 
and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to breathe something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you. That song was written by a guy named Matt Redmond, and Matt serves at a, I guess, a fairly large church in Great Britain, and they have a great band, and he and Matt and his wife, Beth, have written many songs, And but I guess you can imagine that if, if you get caught up in your artistry, you know, that it, that became the focus of his attention rather than his worship of our Heavenly Father. And so he, he was really convicted of that, and he wrote this song. And you can tell from the chorus, he says, I'm coming back 
to the heart of worship. What's the heart of worship? It's us individually, each worshiping God directly as we're worshiping together. It's coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about Jesus. It's all about what God has already done for us. And he says, I'll bring you more than a song. So the band lost its importance. The songwriting lost its importance. What he really found was the only thing that was satisfying in worship was him giving his heart completely and totally, surrendering everything that he has to God Almighty. I just pray that that's where we'll be today. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see.
with your strength I've got no excuse Cause broken people are exactly who you use So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness Give me a heart like David Lord be my defense So I can face my giants with confidence you took a shepherd boy and made him a king. I'm going to trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror because you'll fight for me. I'll be a champion claiming your victory. And give me faith like Daniel and the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. I'm going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see him fall. I'm going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, give me faith like Daniel and the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense, so I can face my giants with confidence. So give me faith like Daniel and the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense, so I can face my giants. With confidence, I'll face my giants with confidence. God, thank you that you give us faith like Daniel, who said, who was told flat out, if you continue to worship God, it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your life. Thank you, God, for giving us hope like Moses who believed everything you had to say about your children, and he was patient enough to wait through all ten of the plagues until you released them to go. And then he was faithful, God, to meet with you and to carry your word to his people. God, thank you so much for these great examples, a heart like David, who you said was a man after your own heart. God, I pray that you'll help us take on that image of you in our own lives. God, I pray for Pastor Jackson as he brings your word today, God, would you open up his heart, his mind, God, that he would speak the truth from your word, God, we pray that as we listen, the Holy Spirit would, would, would speak that same truth into our hearts, the truth we need to hear, God, we, lay, we thank you for your loving kindness, we worship you in spirit and in truth, because you are the king above all kings, the name above all names, thank you for all that you've done for us. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So much. Appreciate y'all. Um, if you want to turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4, Nehemiah chapter 4. As you guys know, we've been going on uh, this book uh, series, uh, and um, today's title is Persistence in Faith. Persistence in Faith. Just a little bit of a background on the book of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah holds this very key position uh, in, 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 uh, where he asked the king, King Xerxes, that says, I am brokenhearted because I've heard reports that my city, Jerusalem, the temple has been desolated and been destroyed. So with that, he asks the king, he asks the king, can I go back there? Can I go back and rebuild. 
So the king gives him the provisions to do so. But before he asks, he, he does one key thing before his next action step. And that action step was prayer. He emphasized prayer and he goes to the Lord and he seeks the Lord in his holiness. So when he seeks the Lord's holiness, God reveals to him the ugliness of mankind. So moreover, he pleads for God's help. He confesses. He brings the people to confess their sins to the Lord. He's broken hearted for this. And then now he makes the request to the king. And the king says and grants him more than he can imagine. He gives them the resources that he needs. He gives them the wood, the timber, all those things, right, that he needs to be able to, rebu- to, to, to rebuild. He even gives them passage safety so that he can because as he goes through different lands and different countries where it's governed governed by different people he gives them safe passage to be able to go to his homeland jerusalem so a little bit more of a background in jerusalem is that it's been desecrated by the babylonians why because the Babel, because the, the, the Jews at that time revolted against God. They trusted on their, themselves. They trusted in their resource and their intellect and their ways that were corrupt, as we know from the sin of Adam that has passed down from generations to generation. So they've walked away from the Lord. Now there were consequences to their actions. The consequence is, as God forewarns them years after years, king after king, to tell them, if you do not walk according to my ways, there will be huge consequences. So God allows for the Babylonians to come and destroy this country. And he, he, he brings those people back to Babylonia. And then after that, a great, another nation comes into power, right, and comes and overtakes Babylon, and that's where we are. That's where the book of Nehemiah is. So what we find out in, is that other nations rose and captured the city of Jerusalem and took Jews with them into captivity. There are three waves of Israelites that came back to Jerusalem to try to assess and try to rebuild rebuild. First, there was Zerubbabel, then then Ezra, the book of Ezra, and then now Nehemiah that we're going through. So, But one thing that's really key is is that the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah himself had very close ties to the king. He had a very unique position. How would you like it where you actually, before the, 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 the powers that be, you were entrusted to taste every food, to drink every drink, to make sure you had that like... That would be the killer job ever, right? I would love that. So that's what he did. He had this very prestigious position where he had close encounters and had the relationship with the king, right? But what's great about it is that the king had to trust this person named Nehemiah for his life. And that's where we're at today. So he, we, as I indicated earlier, after receiving report that his motherland, Jerusalem, has been desolated, right? He goes and he prays first. Let me tell you something. Prayer <laughs> is unlike any other. Prayer works. And we're going to see that here. Prayer is lifted up when we come together and we humble ourselves. God will heal our land. So he goes and he prays, he pleads for God's help, he confesses any sin that is against the Lord, he comes with a broken heart, he's very specific with his request, he trusts in God's uh, provision, and he, God gives him the heart of discretion. As we will see shortly, where there are two key figures, right, that is going to oppose him and will continue to oppose him. He counts the cost. He rebuilds God's kingdom, and God will see him through it. That's what we talked about last week. So today, if you turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4, 
verse 1 to 14. Maybe there's an error there, but it's Nehemiah chapter 4. We're all going to stand up. I'm going to read this short, short passage here. Short to me is like 14 passages, okay? So I'll try to make it quick. It says here, Now it came about when Sanballat heard that we were built, rebuilding the wall. He became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. He spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burnt ones? Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was near him and said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. The mockery. And then the response is in verse 4. Hear, O our God, how we are despised. Return the reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before you, for they have demoralized the builders. So we built the wall. The whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. All of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. But we prayed to our God, and because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah, it was said, the strength of the burden bearers is falling, yet there's much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemy said they will know not they will not know or see until we come among them to kill them and put a stop to their work. And when the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and exposed places, and I stationed the peoples and families with their swords and spears and bows. When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people. And they said, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. You may be seated. So we're talking about persistence in faith. And we've read this through, is that, that now that... that Nehemiah has called his people to rebuild these walls. These breaches that were that was breached are now closing in, but they face opposition. They were being attacked by those by words and by action. So persistence and faith is so key because whenever God has called you and me and everyone else to do what is right, we will face opposition. But the question is, are we going to persist? There's always going to be a challenge. There's always going to be something that they will say against you from a long time ago that you may have done or you might have thought you've said, etc. They could use that. They could use anything against you to discourage you from what God is calling you and I and our church, our community to do. So here's my number number one point. Okay? 11.19. 11.19. I made a promise to the, the praise team last week. I said, hey, we're going to keep it short. But I, I didn't, I didn't, eat, I didn't uh, keep my end of the bargain. So today, hopefully, I'll make it up. Point number one, have no fear. Have no fear. There will be mockery. There will be pleas. There will be resistance outside the camp and inside the camp. Knowing that, right, Sanballat is part Jew, Okay. So he knows the culture, but he was so against these people wanting to rebuild, right? And Tobiah was an Ammonite, right? If you look at the the, the land of Israel right next to it, the neighboring country is Jordan, and the capital of Jordan is Ammon, 
all right? A-M-M-O-N, right? These are these people, the Ammonites. These are Tobiah's people that are still there today, okay? So here, it says here in verse, uh, uh, in verse 14, when I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. You see, sometimes we want to quit. The task is too great, we say. Enemies, you ridicule us. They threaten us because what we've called to do is hard to the point of feeling that it is impossible. That's, why he, that's what the people felt. Jeremiah, you see, Jeremiah, if you look at, if you go reverse, right? Actually, forward, sorry, forward. The book of Jeremiah. If you've not studied the book of Jeremiah, it is, is sad. But let me just give you a little introduction on the life of Jeremiah. See, Jeremiah experienced this as a prophet himself. He was a prophet of the southern kingdom. Because you remember, after, the, after Solomon, there was the, the United Kingdom, the UK at that time, divided the north and the south. You got the north side and the south side, right? Okay? So the north side, the ten tribes of the north, and the two tribes of the south on the south side, right? So Jeremiah's vision, Jeremiah's uh, job was to be able to bring the good news to the southern kingdom. And he was a prophet there for over 40 years. But when Jeremiah spoke to the people, they wouldn't listen. Consistently and passionately, he urged them to act. Not, uh, but not nobody moved. He was poor. He didn't have poor. He underwent severe deprivation to deliver his prophecies. He was thrown into prison. He was, he was thrown into a cistern. He was taken into Egypt against his will. He was rejected by his neighbors, his family, even the false priests and the prophets, his friends, his people, and the king. Throughout his life, Jeremiah stood alone, declaring God the message of doom, announcing the new covenant and weeping over the fate of his beloved country. But he never gave up. That's why it's called, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He wept. Because people's heart was a stone, right? See, Jeremiah was delivering the message God wanted to be delivered, but he was tempted to stop because no one was responding. How many of you guys feel that way at home? We're like, do kids even listen to me anymore, right? But imagine this magnified into states and countries and nations, but this is really key here, if you find it here in, in, in Jeremiah 20, verse 9. It says here, but he had a choice. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding uh, to it. Indeed, I cannot. So he had an option. He, he had an option to, you know what? His life would be better. And and much better if he just not say anything anymore. But he knew the consuming fire of God's word in his heart. It's like, I can't walk away from this. After 40 years. So you may not be Jeremiah. None of us are. But I believe God has put us in our place, in our situation, you in the situation for something great. Yes, it's easy to say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to not say anything anymore. I'm not going to do anything anymore. <laughs> God may put you there just for that purpose, to be able to be used mightily for God, right? So let me just encourage you, and let me encourage you that sometimes discouragement comes in at home. <laughs> discouragement, discouragement comes in in marital relationships, Discouragement comes in in relationships with parenting and our children and vice versa, right? Discouragement comes in in business. Discouragement comes in in churches. Discouragement can come in in societies and cultures. Anywhere there is discouragement. But what do we do with that? As Christians, I think we need to tap into something greater. But see, there's a change of course in history. 
there's a change of course in history. Let me, if you think back in your old history class, your world history, or maybe American history, there was such a, a change in course on June 6, 1944. Okay? See, my mom was born in 1944, but much later. There's something that happened. During World War II, the German forces had literally destroyed Europe. Adolf Hitler had advanced towards most of Europe, but there was a change, of course, that happened in Omaha Beach in France. You guys know this story. The Allies was about to attack on a counter-offensive in the greatest uh, amphibious invasion in military history. But there was... Mis- there were many miscalculations by the Allied forces. I don't know if you guys know this or not. First, it was the challenging weather that they did not predict. Secondly, the, bomb- the bombers that-, that they had initially set forth first before the actual attack missed their targets. They missed the targets due to weather because this thick cloud. Then there were... There, there was a plan where the tanks were supposed to be launched from the vessels onto the beach. However, they did not float as they had planned, and they sank. It was like 37 tanks or something like Only two tanks were able to go to the beach, right? Another was a miscalculation that what, what the U.S. government thought was a morale booster by feeding these sailors, by feeding these Marines before they got onto the beach with the best food ever. But you and I know, before you go fishing or deep sea fishing, right, what happens when you got too much food here? You get sick. And the last thing, and I'm sure there's many, many more, but there's this enormous load that the soldiers carried. Over 100 pounds in their pack. So when they got to, to the beach, as the doors opened, they were being fired upon. And the only way to survive that was to jump on the side. But their packs were so heavy that they sank and they drowned. So miscalculation after miscalculation after miscalculation, then there was a turn here. There was a turn. The U.S. Marines were left unprotected to charge the beach against Hitler's MG-42. I don't know if you guys know what the MG-42 is, created by the Germans. It fired up to 45 rounds per second. This was, this was Hitler's, it was called Hitler's Zipper, is what the name of it was. The change, of course, happens when the Marines fought on fearlessly and eventually took control of the beach. The total total Allied loss at Normandy estimated to be about 4,413. But thanks in the advance of the massive influx of troops and equipment, D-Day marked as the decisive, decisive turning point in the war. And less than one year later, on May 7, 1945, the Germans signed an unconditional surrender. So you look back at history where there's one miscalculation after one miscalculation after one miscalculation. It took the Marines and the Canadian forces as well. We've got to give them and the, 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 the Great Britain, you know, UK forces to come together and they fought on. I think we're in this very peculiar situation as well, spiritually as a country, as a nation, as a state. Let me share with you three scriptures that I feel that you need to really know to not give up, to not give in to fear, instead to give in to faith. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles us, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, Jesus is the prime example of that. Remember, he's 100% God and 100% man. 
So he gave it all to us, for us, for your sons, for your grandchildren, and your future, future offspring. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. See, we might be in that, that, that situation as a, as a country, as a family, as a community, as a church, where we, can go, we are at the cusp of it. Do not be weary. Do not give up. Have faith and don't give in to fear. Isaiah 41, this is one of my favorite passages here, Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, this dominant hand. God can do the impossible. Our job is to not give in to our fear, but to give our faith in him. So point number two, point number two. Remember God's faithfulness at all times. God, remember God's faithfulness at all times. Remember the Lord that he is great and awesome as Nehemiah declares to them. Remember, this is so key. Remember, never forget God's holiness, his continual awareness in your situation. There's no other scripture that I can find that holds very close to me than the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 9. Remember this, Moses, right? Remember, they, they, the Jews at that time, they were held captive for 400 years. Not four days, not 40 days, not four years, not 40 years, 400 years. Where that time where Pharaoh did not know the Jews at all anymore, right? Because of the death of Joseph. So these, these, these Jews were used as free labor, right? They were treated, mistreated harshly. So now Moses hit here. Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Because remember, he grew up, he was, he was that baby that was found in the River Nile and has been taken in and groomed and schooled in the University of Cairo, right, by the pharaohs. And he found out that, you know, there's this brutality against his people. So he revolted in murder. He runs away. He fears and runs away. And God, see, God has a plan. God always has a plan. He never miss, missteps. He never misses these fine details. He sees everything. He knows everything. And he uses Moses for this. It says here, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Hebron, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet it didn't burn. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Why? The bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near me. Remove your sandals from your feet from the place for which you are standing is holy ground. So we have to remember that God's so holy. When you wake up in the morning, you have to recognize it's a blessing that you're alive. It's a blessing that you're breathing. It's a blessing that you're sleeping comfortably in your bed. It's a blessing to be able to go to work. And I know sometimes it's one of those days like, Oh man, do I have to really go to work today, right? You're counting how many PTO you have left, right? We have that. As, even as parents at our home, it's like, oh man, do I have to get up and get the kids up? <laughs> do I have to do all this, um, this, this mountain of laundry, or is it just my house, right? These dishes that mount up, it's just miraculously, you know, these kids, right? They, they drink the water and they just leave it there, or they take the cup and they just leave it there, just like, oh. This amount of work. And you grandparents are just chuckling now. Look at you guys. We'll be there too, okay, parents? We'll, we'll get there, okay? So when you wake up and you recognize God's holiness, God's put you where you're at. Man, 
it changes. It should change your day. It should change your day. Have you gone up that day? When he wakes you up, have you sought upper management? I saw this in Ms. Model's office. Have you sought upper management? Upper management is God that day. Right? Have you reached out to HR and say, hey, I don't know if I'm going to make it today. Right? Right? And you seek him. But man, when you make that connection, because he's such a, a holy God, he cares about you in every single detail, every single word. He cares for you. He loves you so much. And he wants to give you the best. But you have to recognize him first. In verse 5, and it says, Do not come near me. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. And he also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression of which the Egyptians are oppressing them. See, God knows. God knows. You don't have to chug God and say, hey, God, remember, um, <clears throat> you know, this is what's going on, like kind of wake him up. No, you don't. You don't have to do that. God knows. God knows. So with that, never forget the holiness of God and his continual awareness of your situation, of my situation, our situation here, our situation in the community, our situation in our state, our situation in our, our world, et cetera, et cetera. He knows that is who God is. That is the God that we serve. Number two, never forget those intimate moments that only God could have brought you through. Now, this is a little bit more personal. So that one's general. This is a little bit more personal. Where has God sought you through? That only he could have rescued you. Right? Only he could do that. Remember, and Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is really interesting. Isaiah 49 says this, verse 15 and verse 16. And this, moms, you, moms, you guys could attest to this. It says here, can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Question mark. Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. So as a mother, I remember giving birth, anticipating the baby that's coming through, and the dad is like, oh yeah, getting all the, ba you know, the bags ready and stuff like that, ready to go to the hospital. And your mom, and you're remembering giving birth to your child. So God is saying, as a mom, you probably will never forget that, right? But if you do forget, remember that God never forgets any, every single detail of your life. That's what he's saying. That only God can bring you through. And I look back, I'm, I'm, as I'm preparing for this, I was like, man, oh boy. If I had to write down and list, and I, I have a list, by the way, of where God brought me through, <laughs> Only that is a testimony itself that own, that he exists. And I can share you stories, not here. <laughs> I have plenty of them. As I shared with you, I'm the least, least of all to be your pastor because of what God has done for me. But as I fought him, I fought him, I fought him, I know that this is where I need to be. That's where you need to be, wherever you are. You need to be where you need to be, as God's called you. Last, tap into the Holy Spirit, tap into the Holy Spirit. You know, one, this is amazing. <laughs> we have the Holy Spirit. As believers who confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, He lives in you and me. 
I don't think we tap into this because I think we're afraid whenever we say, yeah, I had the Holy Spirit living in me, right? We think we're like Pentecostals or something, right, for some reason. But let me tell you what our brothers in Christ, the Pentecostals do. They live, really live through the Spirit. And I think we have uh, something to learn from them, right? You have the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 says this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you not just for a short bit, but forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides in you and you will be and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live and you will also live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I in you. And he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. Amazing. Judas, not the scariest, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? So he was confused. And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the helper, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, but, but as I do, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Tap into the Holy Spirit. He is powerful. See, when you, there's, there, I don't know if you caught it, is that when you tap into the Holy Spirit and we begin following Him and His ways, because He's the truth, the truth will be revealed to you. He will send that person. And many of you guys know, many of you guys, we celebrated Father's Day last week, right? And many of you guys have great memories of our Father. Some of us, not so great memories. But the Father, through the Holy Spirit, lives in you and me. And he will give you, he will guide you through. It might be somebody discipling you. It might be God's words, and I hope it's God's words. It might be other people that you're reading through that those became my father, right? Because I had an absentee father. Those were my father that loved me, that cared for me, that said, Jackson, you can make better choices. You can make better decisions. You're better. Don't give up, et cetera, et cetera. Number three, okay, make it through. All right. Fight hard in the spirit. Fight hard in the spirit. So the question is, you must know who you're fighting against, who you're fighting for, and you must know why. We're not there just shadow boxing somebody that we can't even see. We know the enemy has laid his hands on you and me, your family, your marriage, your children, your grandchildren, he's going to attack. What must you do? You have to fight hard in the Spirit. Tap into the Holy Spirit that I just shared with you. It says here in, in our in verse, in, in, in Nehemiah chapter 4, it says here, Nehemiah says, fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, for your wives and your houses. Yes, fight. See, Nehemiah armed those working around in the wall to rebuild. He used all his resources through, though some didn't lay a hand to work, most did. He had servants, he had captains, he had builders and trumpeteers, right? That sounded the alarm when the enemy was coming, right? They didn't have like, you know, GPS. They didn't have these, these devices that we have today. They used trumpets to alarm that these people are going to attack us. We need to be alert. They work together for one purpose, one goal, for one God. And guess what? When we do that, <laughs> God does amazing things. Not in our timing, but in God's timing. Amen? 
So as you guys know, you've, you've read the, new, the recent ruling by the Supreme Court. And after the ruling in 1973, where millions upon millions of babies had been killed for inconvenience, now in a landmark decision has been turned over. Opportunities for women to be moms, opportunities for babies to experience life. Through the almost 50 years of prayer, this is fighting in the spirit, prayer after prayer after prayer, we see signs, right? We see all these things, 49 years of prayer. God delivers. This is the first step. There's so many more steps there. This is, this is not the cure-all for everything, but it's a gigantic step that we need to celebrate. Amen? We need to celebrate. I want to share with you Nathan Lorick. He's the president of our um, state convention, SBTC. He is going to be leading our Israel trip in a few weeks He says this, and I'm going to quote. He says, we celebrate with you the victory for the life of the unborn resulting from the Supreme Court's decision today to overturn Roe versus Wade. Over the last 49 years, we have lost generations of image barriers to abortion. We thank the Lord for today's Supreme Court ruling in Dobbs versus Jackson while we acknowledge the ongoing work of state-by-state legislation, expecting mothers and family care and large-scale culture change that must characterize our engagement in the pro-life space moving forward. Our hope and our message now, as always, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. And we thank you so much for hearing us. Thank you for being such a holy, holy, holy God that through situations, Lord, you always win. And Lord, there's more work, Father. There's more prayers. There are more knees to be bent over, to be praying. But Lord, we ask, Father God, that we would seek holiness in you, that you would reveal to us Things, Lord, that are impure, that we need to surrender to you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you would guide our action steps. And that means protecting those that cannot protect themselves. Lord, thank you so much for prayer. A powerful weapon that is not utilized, seldomly used only in the moments of crisis, but we pray that that would be our very first step each and every time, each and every meeting, each every conversation, each situation, each decision would be prayed through and bathed through to our holy God. And we thank you so much for answering those prayers. Lord, you indeed hear every single detail of our life. And may we surrender those things to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to respond uh, today uh, before we do the Lord's Supper. If you want to, just praise and thank the Lord that he answers. You come. It's joy. I'm here. I'm going to have Pastor Joseph come up here as well. We're going to come and pray with you. Pray for you together. You come. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever Hey.
be seated as we uh, turn our uh, service now to uh, the Lord's Supper. For those that are home, um, I want you to pay attention so we can go through this together. So I want to invite you to take a seat as we enter into the uh, observation of the Lord's Supper. Today we'll be taking the Lord's Supper, so I want the ushers to be able to come forward uh, on on my side. Thank you. So at the Last Supper, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples, and he led them in observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread called the Passover. At this point, I'll be passing this back. Jesus, the master teacher, used this opportunity to plant an important memory in his disciples during the gathering at the upper room. Jesus shared this meal for their benefit and ours today. As Jesus raised the bread and the cup in thanksgiving, he added a new significance in the meaning of the word Passover. Luke 22 records that Jesus told his disciples to observe the Passover in remembrance of me. Jesus took an old symbol and made it new. The meaning of Jesus' words and actions is rooted in his commandment to remember. As today's disciples, we observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ Jesus, not what he did in suffering in the death of the cross. 1 Corinthians 11 says, uh, Paul gives instruction concerning the Lord's Supper. In doing so, he reminded the Corinthian Christians two things their personal salvation in Christ Jesus, that this is only for believers, and that participation in the Lord's Supper carries inward and outward aspects. Inwardly, participants are to examine themselves spiritually before taking the supper. And outwardly, participants should proclaim through the supper the Lord's death until he returns. Luke 22, verse 11 says, when he has taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave, it, gave thanks, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take of the bread.
1 Corinthians 11.25 says, In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the cup. Let us pray. Father, we come before you. Thank you so much for the ordinances of the Lord's Supper. And thank you, God, that as we reflect back on what you did in the lives of the disciples, to be that shepherd, to be that master, to be that model for them to follow. And Lord, I pray that still applies to us today. We remember what you've done You gave it your very best for each one of us so that we can have life. So I pray, Father, as we come before you and we partake this, that we, when we walk out of these walls, these, this building, we would be change agents, Father, for you. We'd be disciples, seeking for someone to disciple, seeking someone to share the gospel because of what you've done for us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that honor and that privilege of being called your sons and daughters for your kingdom. Father, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Ushers, you can be seated. Thank you so much for joining us.